So do you enjoy the content here on Thoughtful Faith? If so, be sure to hit the notification bell. This ensures that our new videos show up on your feed. Also, be sure to check out our Facebook group called Thoughtful Saints, where myself and others discuss the sorts of topics found on this channel. And lastly, if you think other people would benefit from this video, please be sure to share it. Hey everyone, thanks for joining me on this episode of Still Brothers. In this program, I have conversations with my atheist brother, Forrest, who runs the channel Latter Day Skeptic. His channel focuses on critiques of the church and religious belief generally. In the end, we may disagree, but we recognize that we are still brothers. And I think that is the secret ingredient for navigating faith differences. I hope you enjoy today's episode. Good evening, everybody, and welcome to tonight's show. I'm Jacob Hansen, your host, and I am joined today by my brother, the Latter-day Skeptic, Forrest Hansen. Forrest, how you doing, man? Good. How you doing? Awesome. Well, as we uh, have been doing in these episodes, we are taking a look at each other's videos that we've put together and just kind of pulling clips and things that we all want to offer uh, critique on. Uh, but we're also trying to model... Uh, a good exchange between people who disagree, trying to steel man one another's points, make sure we truly understand and are attacking or critiquing the best of each other's arguments. And then one other principle that we try to abide is to not try and convince one another of anything, but more so compare and contrast and to seek clarity in understanding the nature of our different points of view rather than trying to necessarily convince each other why we're right. And hopefully that leads to greater understanding, which oftentimes clarifies a lot. So thanks yeah, for joining me. I actually, actually want to add one thing to that too. And I think in the previous episodes, we've, we've got to feel for it a little bit. Um, and just like a little bit of epistemic humility. It's like we come at, a lot of these are really complicated issues and you'll feel yourself starting to dig in and wanting to like get your point right. And you're like, wait a minute, this is so hard. There's no like shame and not knowing the relationship between these, you know, all these different pieces that are like super conceptually challenging. So I think we've done a pretty good job so far of like, yeah, not, and I think a lot of the time, when, heels we, in too much. when we dig into the areas that are more fundamental, a lot of the times where we actually have genuine sort of disagreements, um, you know, on fundamental kind of issues, there is more epistemic humility on both sides. And so it's easier for us to approach it more as curious explorers rather than as like ardent debate opponents who are trying to beat yeah. each other up. But there, there will be subjects where it's a little bit more where we have a little more solid lines and we'll get after it a little more. Cool. So today I am playing the role of the critic, kind of critiquing one of Forrest's videos and Forrest will be more or less playing the apologist sort of uh, defending her, his, his sort of position or maybe what he This never said. happens. Yeah. <laughs> I'm never the apologist. What? Exactly. Most people don't realize that like in any conversation, pretty much there's a critic and then there's the apologist. There's the one with who's, who's offering the criticism and the one who has to defend whatever they've constructed. So it's good to mix it up, play both roles. All righty. So you made a video uh, talking about the Western mind. Uh, I, or I made a video originally, actually, this is a response to your response. So I'm responding to your response to my, my yeah. video. I'm here to um, defend it, though. Uh, yeah, I I made a video talking about how Christianity has deeply influenced the way that we think in the Western world. Um, and a lot of our conceptions in the West, if you take away Christianity, it really robs the West of sort of key ethical and sort of metaphysical ideas that have undergirded our society and a lot of the progress that was made. Um and one of the the clips that I wanted to play here, um, is it nine oh eight in this video? Let me prep it real quick. Um, and it's on the subject of human rights. Um, my contention was that the notion of rights is very much connected deeply to Christianity uh, in the West and its influence on the West. And so, in your video, you offer this this segment which um, more or less critiques that, uh, that point of view. So let's, 
let's watch it here. Sure, that predated it, just like the rest of history. Declaration of Human Rights, which is the world's most widely accepted document on the subject. But it was a long time in coming. At first, there were no human rights. If you were in with the right crowd, you were safe. If you weren't, well, you weren't. But then a guy named Cyrus the Great decided to change all that. After conquering Babylon, he did something completely revolutionary. He announced that all slaves were free to go. He also said people had the freedom to choose their religion, no matter what crowd they were a part of. They documented his words on a clay tablet known as the Cyrus Cylinder. And just like that, human rights were born. The idea spread quickly to Greece, to India, and eventually to Rome. They noticed that people naturally followed certain laws, even if they weren't told to. They called this natural law. Cyrus the Great gives us evidence of human rights that predate Jesus by 500 years. And Greece and Rome also have this notion of human rights that predates Christianity. This natural law. But it kept... So I'm going to go to that point. Um, let me try and steal, man, what I think you're trying to get across there. The basic idea is that human rights were not invented by Jesus or Christianity. The notion of human beings having rights is a concept that has existed prior to Christianity and can be found in other societies, such as with Cyrus the Great. Um, and then, you know, Romans had certain notions of human rights. And maybe later in Western history, these were universalized and maybe Christianity played some part in that. But but you but the very the notion of human rights is something that is not a Christian idea. Is that a fair summation? What would you add or take away? Yeah, I think this whole topic is hard because, for me at least, because I have a hard time even understanding what your argument is. Like, so, but in, in that clip in particular, and in you know most of the video, it's basically this stuff didn't necessarily come from Christianity. Christianity played a role for sure. To, to what extent? It's very complicated, and there's not easy lines to be drawn. And then. At the end of it all, I think our society is actually very different than what you would get if you just built a society out of Christianity. Okay. And in in some of the most critical things that make the West so unique, it's like anti-Christian. Okay. Or some so, of those principles are anti-Christian. So so let, let's talk for a minute about just this notion of a right, okay? Because I think that there's a misunderstanding here of what I mean when I'm talking about a right. Okay. A right as I'm defining it is not a privilege granted to you by the state, by the sovereign, by the one in power. Okay. There's a difference in the concept of human rights and then privileges granted by the, the one in power. The way I look at Cyrus the Great, for instance, or, or other leaders, Cyrus was a very benevolent ruler. His concept was not one that people have some sort of... So so actually, first, let me define what I mean by rights. A, def, a right is a, um, a... What is the word I'm trying to look for? Not inheritance. It is a uh, an entitlement that a person has, a moral entitlement, right? That they're entitled to due to some moral standard that exists above and beyond anyone else in the world, right? It isn't that the king gave you this right. Your right came from a, it was inherent in some sort of a moral order. It is, what we're saying fundamentally is like, you have a right to your property, for instance, let's say. Well, that's just saying that it is wrong for someone else in a moral sense to take that away from you. And that is why if the government does something, like it isn't justified just because the government does it, because the government is not the origin of that right or that moral standard that granted you that entitlement. Okay? So that's when I'm talking about rights. I'm not talking about the fact that he's like, hey, in my kingdom, I'll let anyone worship whatever God you want. You can all have freedom of speech or whatever. 
look at me. I'm such a benevolent king for giving you all these privileges. Okay. Cyrus was very much of that type. He, he didn't have some philosophy that said, you all have a moral entitlement from God and I'm just God's, you know, I'm, I'm subject to this. And, and that's why, and, and not only does everyone have this, cause it may have existed that some people felt like the gods want this and that's why I'll do it, but that it was universal in nature that everyone by virtue of just being human, a human right has to be universal to all human beings. Otherwise it's not a human right. Okay. So what I'm, my argument is, is that that sort of a conception very clearly was birthed out of the philosophy of liberty that emerged during the enlightenment and it emerged during the enlightenment due to the challenges to the authority of both church and state that had just previously come during the um during the reformation period the reformation period was the great challenge both to church and state authority and when the way you challenge authority is you have to say we all are equal the king is no and the pope is no greater than me we are all equals in the eyes of god and that creation of a universal view that all men were equal before god was literally instantiated into our declaration of independence in the words that all men are created equal endowed by their creator right the, the, the rights don't come from the king. The rights come from the creator. And that is the basis for human rights in the West that developed. And if you take the entire Christian context out of that and the notion that all men are equals before God, it robs that of its universality. And you're still left in the world of Cyrus the Great where the sovereign holds the power and he bestows the privileges rather than the concept of rights. So that's my little speech there. So what are your thoughts? My thoughts are, I think for the most part, it is a narrative that doesn't make any difference okay. because you... whether or not people believe they have these universal human rights, um, we still live in the world of Cyrus and we will always live in the world of Cyrus. So you can say we all have human rights and it's because of God or it's because of Allah or it's because of whatever magical fairy tale. Like at the end of the day, we still live in the exact same place that we've always been, which is a world where the people with the power can take away our rights. Okay. But the question is, is but, but this is the question. The question is, do you have rights at all? As I've defined them, meaning, so, do you have, do you actually have a moral entitlement to anything? I think, um, well, I'll say yes to that, but you're not going to like my yes, because I don't think we have a moral entitlement because we're entitled to it from God. I think that it's totally possible that I believe we have moral entitlements. Why? Well, and, and, and my thing is, is that to justify that people have a moral entitlement, there has to be something to say, why is a person entitled to anything? Why is it not ultimately power and preference? And I mean, it is ultimately, it is power and preference. And you but, get what you well, get. <laughs> but that's so this is where like, I think you're not escaping the real world. You're just adding no, a, no, no. a story I, on I'm, top of I'm it. I'm positing a moral reality here. Okay. I'm I'm positing the existence but, of the fact that that. But what I'm that, saying is, does it, it make is a actually difference? Actually, wrong to to. Well, it makes a huge difference because if indeed there is a moral entitlement that needs to be respected, a right, it, then the king can actually do wrong. He can actually be violating a moral law by violating the rights of others, and we but can what say saying, that is that it different? Wrong. I think it's wrong. Yes, but. The king doesn't. And in your worldview, it's the same dilemma. No, no, no. No, it's not. Because in well, my worldview, the king the practical is going to be held accountable to God. And the so king, you can say, the king, king, you can't take this away because of God. And he's like, yeah, okay, I'll figure that out later that's when what, I die. I'm not, but for quick, now, I'm taking away your rights. I, I, think there's a, I think there might be a misunderstanding here. I'm not saying that your rights can't be violated. 
of course your rights can be violated. The question is, is was there a right there at all in the first place to violate? This, it, and yeah, and this is sounding very much like the moral, like, I think it's totally possible to say, I think that I have these rights and I think you're violating my rights. Or, yes. or even I have, I but, have established my rights or we have established uh, well, well, our but, rights. But, but, but that, that's fine. But it's I would say that you're those, saying, those aren't, is there those a aren't rights. ultimate? Those are, those are your preferences. They're things that you want. There's no, in order for something to be a, a, an entitlement connected to, to something moral, to a moral entitlement, there has to be some sort of a conception that there's some sort of a moral accountability if you violate the moral standard. Um, because well, this is this is yeah because this is just, it's very tied to the moral discussion to begin with. It, it absolutely is because and real I, quick no, just, I don't just, believe just so that, that we just so we recognize it rights are nothing more than a moral entitlement that's what they are the the whole con concept of rights is 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 the concept of morality it so, says so that, my answer is or and this is where I'm just going to ask you do you, can I have a moral standard Yes, but your moral standard is arbitrary and based on your own preferences. Yes, so I have a moral standard, and with that, I have moral. I have things that I believe are moral rights or moral. Uh, yeah, moral rights. I'm thinking about this, but because your standard is arbitrary, and the king's, it's a, and, and I don't like arbitrary. Right. It is not arbitrary. It is my preference. But my, I have a lot of reasons, and I have a lot of things, factors, and there's no there's your, your preferences are patterns. arbitrary. They're, your your preferences are based on your on your constitution and the cu culture you grow up in, and all of those different things. I, maybe I'll just grant it to you, but like I think arbitrary means like but kind my, of like random. Here's my they're not random. What, what anyway. I'm getting to though is that, and this comes down to the 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 conundrum that I talk about about individual uh, humanism versus collective humanism, right? So. If you are indeed an individualist humanist who thinks that my own individual well-being is the ultimate thing in life and the thing of most importance, well, what happens when you have someone who's the king who says, well, my, my, I will stomp all over your preferences to get my what I want. And so there is and, no and moral system of in, like there is no there are no rights here. There are just people who say, I prefer this. You prefer that in the system. You just described the real world. Well, that's fine. You can say that's the real world. What I'm saying, though, is this, is that in the real world, um, in my conception of it, it is actually against the king's preferences to do harm to you and to rob you of your rights because God will hold him accountable for his behavior. In your yeah. real world, well, hold on. In, in your real world, that doesn't ha exist. In my real world, there that does. So these are these are different ways of 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 conceptualizing. And whether whether or not what's the real world and what isn't, that's kind of beside the point here. The point is is that there's a distinction. There's a distinction between the concept but of rights. The distinction and the concept though is. Of preferences and but what thing is, if the distinction doesn't affect the 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 act because you keep bringing up these examples what are you going to do when you say king you can't take away my rights and he says yes i can i have the power i'm like i'm going to do exactly what i'll do in real life which is fight or get killed or submit like and that's just the story of humanity I'll it makes an enormous difference when a person feels that they have moral accountability because they'll alter their behavior, the king will actually say to himself, I, and we will choose the king or elect the king or whatever. If it's a, if it's a mon or democratic system that has that value of there being actual human rights, because that grants us a level of assurity that he knows that he's not only accountable to his own whims but that he's ultimately accountable to god and oh and this is this is getting back behave so this is a nice segue into back like so we're talking about like does this 
um, did, did the West come from Christianity? Is that the foundation for our ethic, basically? And I would say the fact that we have a democracy is a great example of why now we check the power of the king by the vote. We don't check the power of the king by God to say, hey, like, in fact, that's what part of, like most of medieval Europe was. It was like, oh, the God's going to be or the king's going to be held accountable to God. He'll act good. And then, of course, he doesn't. But now it's like, OK, that strategy didn't work. It didn't work having God be the arbiter or the accountability factor. We need to do it with our own vote. And with and where do you, the masses. And, and, and historically, the origins of the democratic system, while definitely influenced by the democratic systems that existed in, in classical antiquity, were actually spurred. The reason they, they began to pop up post-Reformation was because in the Reformation was the era in which all of the authority structures were actually challenged. And they were challenged on the basis that we all had that the plowboy had just as much authority from God as the Pope. And if all of us share in an equality of authority, well, then we all should be equals on earth. There is no one who is inherently has authority over others. And so that seems to be very not Christian and definitely not Mormon. No, no, no. Within within the structure of civic government, absolutely. The the, the idea here is is that a what king. Saying, what is, is the, why is there a separation between civic government and re, a theocracy? Like, to me, that's a Western concept that is directly at odds with Christianity as well. Directly emerged from Christianity. The very idea of the secular was something that arose from Christian thought in separating the even the idea of religion from the non-religious. Um, these are these are concepts that that were very much rooted within Christianity. The only reason we even use the word secular today was from the cyculum, which was something that the Christian, uh, I think it was Augustine. Yeah, this um, is this is like Sam Harris's point where, yeah, of course, all of our stuff came through Christianity because there was no one else. Our heritage is Christianity. That's like, and he, I think he gave like a bridge. It's like saying like Christians yeah. build all the bridges. It's like, yeah, because all the people at the time were Christian. That doesn't mean that. Bridges were built because of Christianity. Yeah, but no, like, no, no. But these the term secular. Were, sure, these they, things were built. No, no, no. These were these were built very much in the in the way that Christians thought about the world and saw the world. Christians had in their mindset the idea because literally because of the scriptures that all men were actually equals before God. Now there were now obviously you can say well there were verses that said that you know uh, that would make you think otherwise. Yeah, but well, and there was other cultures wild. that also had some form of human rights. And I mean, it's like this universal aspect is weird because I don't know if no, anyone most, actually most believes religions in universal. traditionally have been tribal, very, very tribal in nature. What I'm saying like, is even and Judaism, Christianity. Even tri no, Christianity was, was universalizing from the start with, G with, with, with Paul saying there is no more Greek nor, uh, nor bond or free, you know, there was a Christian, the Christian movement, from its so, inception, had a very I, I, this is, feel. I I heard this yeah, like not that long ago, a few days ago. Um, the story of what was it? Jesus and um, the Samaritan woman. The feed, yeah, the Samaritan woman feeding scraps yeah. to the dogs. Mm -hmm. Like even Jesus himself was not a universalist. No, not in his not in not in the in the initial sort of thing that that came out of it but he later what uh, but well there's a lot of debate over those verses just so you know but uh, here's the point that i'll make let's let's use peter okay it, it always was that the that the jews were the chosen people and it was a very tribal kind of thing jesus himself was an observant jew peter's vision of the um the unclean things that he wasn't supposed to eat and then he he was told by God, don't call things that I've made clean, unclean, eat. And it was the revelation that he was supposed to take the gospel to all people throughout all the world. And if you do read the New Testament, Jesus Christ said that he wanted to baptize all nations, go into all nations and all people, right? The 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 Samaritan woman, if anything, is more of an yeah, but, anomaly. But, but that doesn't, that, be wanting to baptize everyone doesn't mean you believe in universal human rights. Oh, absolutely, or that, yeah. or that everyone is equal. It means well, oh, I want going, to go convert going, everybody. Paul yeah, of course. Very clearly, when he wanted to, when they wanted to take the gospel to the Gentiles and baptize people who are not of the Jewish faith, that was a big 
big difference to the way things had been viewed historically. Paul's message that there is no more Jew nor Greek, uh, Jew nor Greek, and he, he clearly was blurring those lines and creating a universalized conception and, of humanity. And the, whether whether you think that they originally, what, whatever the people thought originally, the reality is that the Christians have interpreted that message to want to universalize Christianity to the whole world. Okay. And the trend has always been in that direction within the Christian movement. So what I'm saying is, is regardless of what happened initially, by the time of the Reformation, which was just an earth shattering paradigm shift, when the Bible finally got into the hands of the common people and was widespread, the people reading the Bible, that's the message they got from it. And the first thing they did was they had challenged the authority of the Pope. And then eventually they challenged the authority of their state structures. And the, and that second part, the challenging of the state structures, was very much the fuel of the Enlightenment. The Enlightenment did not emerge from nothing. It emerged from the Christian Reformation. So, best case scenario, you're saying, the time of Jesus, Jesus wasn't necessarily teaching this. But eventually, it trickled down and was interpreted this way. And... The result that you get is a universality of human rights, which can be taken away by the government because there's still the power preference problem. Um, and that's basically the best case story, right? Like, I mean, where do you get democracy? Where do you get freedom of speech? Where do you get uh, liberalism? I, I guess you could say. Okay, let's let's go through. Let's go through each one of those kind of one at a time. Let's talk because you talked about this in your video. I won't watch the clip because you. You kind of talk about this. It, so you say that there are these certain values like freedom of speech. Or, democracy. Actually, I have a question. Maybe this is a better way to put it. What do you think are, when you say Christianity made the West, what are a few of the defining characteristics of the West? We could go with some of those ones you just mentioned. You okay. said freedom of speech. Because that's what I, yeah, I, I was like, oh, those are, okay. I think I Googled we, it. We can say freedom of speech. Um, we could say, I mean, uh, we could freedom talk about religion. Freedom of religion, and we could talk about uh, democracy. Okay, we can talk about all of that. Okay, now here's the thing about all of these: all of these actually are not separate things. They're all out. Well, they're all under. Particular... Okay, so they're under the umbrella of human rights. They're they're under the um um yes, but they're, they're under they're... the umbrella. They're under the umbrella of liberty. The philosophy of liberty. If there was a if there was a word that came out of it, but where did this idea come from of liberty? The philosophy of liberty is rooted in the notion of self ownership. Okay, it's the idea that you, when it comes to other people, no one else has an entitlement on your life, your liberty, or your property more than you. Okay, and so you are. I mean, so these are. And, this is where it's, it's fun. That's a great idea. But that's just not how it works. Yeah, but that was the idea that built the West. <laughs> okay? When people don't all steal from each other and feel that there is a moral law that they're entitled to that says you can't. This is the, this is the, I love this from Hitchens too. This is like, do you really think that, like, that there weren't societies? Like, what does he always say? If they had believed it was okay to steal from each other, they wouldn't have made it this far. No, there's plenty I, I of societies agree. that that Hold understand up. that. Hold up, you got it. Remember, the quite you can say, okay, are these Christian values are these Western values. You can put any label on you that that you want to. The question is, are they true values? Is it true that human beings have an entitlement to their own labor, a moral entitlement? I believe that, or it is my preference that people have. I, I believe people have an entitlement. Okay. The difference is, is that people who prefer that everyone has an entitlement to their own goods is different from saying that you are accountable to, uh, to God universally. Yeah, but for that accountability has not worked out very well. So we've made real life changes. Now you're accountable to us. If the government wants to, you know, if, the, the federal government wants to march troops into to our cities and the, the leadership so the only, is going to get ousted. Well that, and that's fine. That's fine. You can go that route. You can say that ultimately those in power 
are the ones who the might makes right. If they're in charge, they can't they can't like violate a moral law because they set the law. None. According to my standard, they violated a law. Well, your st- they didn't violate any law. They violated your preference. Yeah, that is my standard. My sin. And so therefore, I need to use my power and preference to keep my moral standard at the top. And so it's just a Hobbesian nightmare of who has the power. And Yeah, but that's the world you live in. So it's not, right. I mean, if, that, if you think okay, the world's a nightmare, you, then you think the world's a nightmare. But... That, if you grant that, well, then there is no such thing as universal human rights. There's just power and preference. Well, or there's, I believe, my, according to my standard, everyone has universal human rights. You, you, you need to add the word like, ultimate or objective well but the thing is fine objective Uh, there's nothing there to say that people actually have entitlements there's just things that you prefer that people have and there's things that other people prefer that people have now regardless of what the reality is my point is is there's a big difference from saying you need to do this because I prefer it. You need to respect people's rights but because I prefer it. And saying you will be held accountable to some cosmic standard of justice if you violate our rights. It is wrong to the, do the that. The only it, difference, the only difference is a linguistic difference. Or it is a, a narrative difference. The reality is if you tell the king, if you can't violate my rights because you will be held accountable to God, he'll say, I live in the normal world of the Hobbesian nightmare and I can do what I want. Yeah. And in, and if and so what happens is we're like, I feel like this is it, like a, a Hitchens razor. Like, you no, can it's assert a, it's that. A, it's, it's a simple you, it's a simple thing. I'm saying that, yeah, if there is no God, you're right. But if there is a God, that king is going to suffer in hell of her eternity or whatever the, the case may I, be. I, I agree. But what I'm saying and is so do it doesn't make a difference how right the now. King's actions, do you see how the king's actions might be restricted if he realizes that he is not the ultimate authority on earth? Yes. And we've realized that that is not a good model to assume. So luckily for all of us. No, we've said, actually, I would said, say that my whole point in this whole thing is that that is the model that the West assumed, and that's the reason well, the universal why, human rights grew out of the out uh, in the West. And so why then, why do we have a democracy? The history. The whole point of a democracy is that we actually have the power. real power. Go ahead. What was you? Saying? We're not. I said. Then why do we have a democracy? The whole point of a democracy is we've realized, like, hey, um, at least. As far as the earth goes, we're the only ones we got to look out for ourselves here because we can say God's going to punish this guy, but it doesn't seem to have a whole lot of effect on him. You know, what would have an effect is if we actually can, we hold the power over him and we can take away his power. Why not both? Because it's power and preference. So the preference of all of us and, and our cumulative power can actually supersede the power of an authority, like a king or a president. Why not both? I think that's what we did. I think what we said is that we 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 both created a moral standard by which we said we're going to judge and try and elect our leaders, meaning we want to put people in power who believe that they're accountable to God because we believe that will hold back their their avarice. And then we also said, and we're going to put in additional structures in place to help to check that power so, itself. And so and I, I, so I totally to agree with that. I agree with that. But when you say something made the West, the structures that are in the real world are the things that are made. No. The narrative that, that they're going to be held accountable after the fact, that's not, they didn't, that's not the West. The West is democracy. The West, is, the West isn't there's an overarching narrative. Well, first that, of all, we're not a democracy, and in fact, democracy is a terrible form of government. I mean, I mean, you know, you know, kind of what I'm saying. Basically, I know, I know what you're saying, but what I'm the, saying is that there's there's a reason for that, 
It's because our society did not build itself on pure democracy. It built itself on the concept of human rights. And in fact, our democracies are curtailed exactly in response to the fact that we believe that people have human rights. And that's the reason we don't have a pure democracy. And, and so these concepts, and the other thing is, is no, it is not the structures that built the West. You can have any sort of political structure that you want. If you have crappy people who steal and rob and are dishonest and ma Machiavellians, you don't get a cooperative society. Yeah, society but I would flip it the other way. You can have structures. And you can have a value structure or, or you can have a, a claim of eternal justice all you want. But if you don't have a structure on earth that it implements it, then it's it makes no difference. You're going to have crappy people running amok because – Actually, uh, actual structure is what's important. Actually, if you have enough people, as John Adams said, if people are angels, no government is necessary. And in fact, as a people are more able to self-govern according to a moral standard that is a, a good moral standard that actually promotes universal human well-being, the less you need the structures at all. Yeah, but like I've talked about in the in, in previous episodes, we have both agreed that you can have well-being without an eternal standard or an, an, an objective uh i guess you could say that is an objective standard but without like a yeah but i would here's what i would say i would say no not without cosmic justice because if you don't have cosmic justice in the equation of your moral system then your moral system says yeah if you can get away with it then lie or steal or cheat so this is where we're going to have to – at one point, we're going to have to maybe get away from a video thing and just do a morality discussion so I can present my moral framework just because I just – this whole – if you can get away with it, I don't think that's the real world. Well, let's, let's take a look at something real quick. Um, and, I, and, I, and I actually you, – you actually do have a certain amount of a point there. Uh, I, obviously, I can't get into all the details now, but I do agree that there is a level of self-checks and balances within – within living in a society that creates some of that. But it's a separate topic. I do want to go into, though, the idea of freedom of speech because you brought it up specifically in the video. Freedom of speech is a subset of a different freedom. It's not, it's not its own thing. It emerges as a logical consequence of us all being equals. If I'm an equal with you, then what's to say that you can say whatever you want, but I can't, right? So God. what was that? God has restrictions on speech. God's restrictions on speech are moral injunctions, not state imposed injunctions, according to what I believe to be true Christianity. To have blasphemy laws, for instance, blasphemy commandments within the within the structure of like scripture or something like that. It's one thing for me to say, Forrest, you should not tell your wife that she's a fat idiot. And it's another thing for me to actually use a law that stops you from being able to do certain, from being able to express. Certain I, I agree, ideas. but what I'm, that differentiation, I don't know how you're making that. As in, like, where if Christianity was this foundation, where was this justification for saying no, no, no? We need to actually separate the religion from civic laws. Are you, ask, are you asking where's like the, the separation connection? of church and state is almost, uh, I would argue. Oh, separation of church and state is an easy one. That is absolutely resulted because of the Christian idea of separating the secular from the religious, which is a Christian idea that emerged out of Christianity and nowhere else on earth. But uh, I don't. For one, I don't know my history well enough, but where and how is that justified? There's also a little bit of an so issue very, that I'm having very early of, on. Of, August you're having people. About this, oh. Who? Augustine talked about the city of God and the city of man. Okay. And what he basically said is there's a difference between the structures of the, the temporal world and things of spiritual concern. Okay. The city of God, the city of man. And what he said was that the, the, the city of man is the, the, the cyclum, which was this notion of kind of the fleeting and the things that pass away, but the eternal stuff is sort of the that we need to bind ourselves to, which is religio, which is this idea of binding something. This stuff all emerged uh, 
within Christianity and that there was a mindset that there was a separation between these two things. Jesus Christ himself is actually the origin of this. When Jesus Christ talked about my kingdom is not of this world within the new Testament, there's a clear delineation between the kingdom of Caesar and the kingdom of Jesus Christ. And those are the notions within Christian tradition that created the, the, the seedbed that eventually said, by the time of the Reformation, when they wanted to begin to say, hey, we want to reject the authority of the Pope, well, they recognized that the Pope and the religious structures were integrated with the with the sec, with the, the civic structures, and they said, we need to actually separate those from one another because they they were really it's a bad deal. <laughs> Because the the secular and the and and the idea and the basically they they could see that the affairs of Caesar and the affairs of Jesus had been commingled. Yeah, I just think it's a stretch to say that throughout the whole Bible, and then Jesus, and then from Jesus to the Reformation, this idea wasn't a thing, and then the Reformation happens because people are getting irritated with the leadership, and the people oh, no, basically it, it, overthrow it, leadership, and was, now what, you attribute could, it to being a Christian principle. <laughs> Well, Christianity started as a as a small kind of radical group. What happened was is when Constantine eventually took Christianity and made it the state religion of Rome, there were a ton of people who joined the, the Christian church that were joining it because it was the official state religion. Okay, Christianity, when it was basically taken over by the Roman Empire, was essentially bastardized into the Roman Empire. And so what you had was essentially the continuation of the Roman empire, but Christianity was kind of inside of it. But, the, but if, the, imagine the if you were at that time, what, what justification you could literally go to the old Testament for justification for why there is no separation between God's kingdom and the kingdom of man. Like the, the old Testament, Testament is full of, of, of yeah. societies living by God's law. And in fact, in fact, it is in, in fact, that's the, that is one of the New Testament messages that Jesus Christ brings to the world. All of the Jews expected Jesus to be the political Messiah. They expected him to show up with a sword in hand saying, we're going to kick some Roman ass. And instead he shows up and he says, love your neighbors. And he says, like, and that's one of the reasons that the zealots and other Jews hated Jesus was because he, he's saying he's the Messiah, but like, bro, you're not the Messiah. You're here to make Israel great again. You're not here to... To go and like make yeah, but I still don't see how you get the separation of church and straight state from that. Because Jesus Christ fundamentally said, "My kingdom is not of this world." Yeah, he that, came that's into a stretch. the no, kingdom of not of this that's, world. That's the kingdom of God. To, yeah, sure. Go and read. Sure, the kingdom of God is not you. Earth. Well, it is very is... much clear that the kind of kingdom that Jesus Christ was bringing to the world was a different kind of kingdom. It was a kingdom that was in each one so of us. What what year was Augustine? Uh, I think Augustine was like 300 something in the first 300 years of Christianity. But I mean, and, and even then, like, it's not until the Reformation that this is even put into practice. Yes. And you want to know why? It's because the entire Because Christian, you had a bunch Christian, of people that were really irritated with the Pope. Yeah. Because guess what? Because for <laughs> the past, used, ever since. They picked the and choose some, some Bible verses to justify it. Because the Pope had was basically a, t a pawn of the continuation of the Roman Empire. Why do you think the Pope is located in Rome? Remember, but, once but Rome remember, became... you you were making the argument that if you have this justification that God will will judge you, then people are going to act well. You had the Pope himself as acting improperly. You think the popes, the, the, a lot of the popes were were far more political actors than spiritual actors in any sense of the imagination. No, I know, and, that, and that's because my point. My point is, it is not a good strategy to rely on punishment in the afterlife to regulate human action. Oh, it it most certainly is, but it isn't foolproof. <laughs> my my whole point is this, if you look historically at the origin of our western notion of human rights, you can trace it back to the enlightenment and the enlightenment ideas about liberty were rooted in the ideas of equality amongst all people of authority, things like the priesthood of all believers, which arose from the Reformation. And those ideas arose from the notions of New Testament Christianity, which were, which remember, nobody even had the New Testament in mass, like in, in large scale, until the printing press. Once the New Testament got out and everyone started reading it, there was an intellectual 
and and ethical like reformation of Western society based on the principles in that book, which they all held as the as the standard. And that is from that that emerged the Western world. The Enlightenment came out of the Reformation, and the Reformation came out of the New Testament. And to say otherwise is just to ignore the history. <laughs> no, to me, it's it's more a matter of of causation. It's like hard to argue that it's like yeah, these ideas came out of those places, but whether or not the Reformation happened as a result of people being irritated, and then maybe they used the Bible to justify some of their actions. That may be the case, but it doesn't there's been, mean... There's been a million irritated people in human history. There's been a million oppressed people in human history. No, everyone wants their own liberation. What's, yeah, what I'm saying, weird, what's weird is to have a movement that wants universal liberation of all mankind. That's never happened before. That's why slavery ended. That's why the West pers pushed. Uh, 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 that's why tribalism, as it has existed in humankind in large extent, ended in the world. Or one of the major factors to that was this universalizing but, so, message. But like, even this is where again I, I point you back to the real world. It's like tribalism does not is not ended. Universal oh, human rights is a thing that we talk about in theory, but in no way is it actually applied. We have – the thing is if you compare it to utopia, sure, we're not there yet. You compare it to the world in 500 AD, we are a heck of a lot closer and we're way less tribal. And human rights, again – I know, but, but – and one of the big themes in that video was this is super complicated. So for anyone to be like, oh, I know, blah, blah, blah. It's like, for example, here's – there could be this progression of – we're limiting tribes and adding more people to our tribes and having larger groups until eventually it becomes universal. Perhaps that was because the world itself was just getting explored more. We were able to communicate more. Now we're able to actually see videos of people in Africa. So now a, a starving kid in Africa actually affects us. So now our tribe isn't just the people we talk to. It's growing. And now we see that, hey, these people that are on the other side of the world aren't so different from us. Like perhaps that's why... But to some extent, I think that's true. But that's one of I like don't... a million factors that is not taken into the into account when someone makes this bold claim that Christianity built this. And if you get rid of Christianity, it's gone. Well, if the thing is, if you ask what are the major factors that developed Western civilization, okay, clearly the idea of universal human rights. What I'm saying is that, that, like, that would be – it's hardly even that clearly articulated in the Bible. And you know that because the the apostles themselves weren't that clear on it. They didn't even follow it that clearly themselves. Je like I said, Jesus himself wasn't that clear. If this was like the message of the Bible, then it would have been nice if it was like, hey, guys, this is very clear. This is what we're preaching, universal human rights. But then you have Jesus like talking about the, what is it, Sumerian woman as a dog asking for scraps. Yeah, and Jesus ends up blessing her. <laughs> yeah, but also only after she and, basically and Jesus and Jesus herself. went to the Samaritans. That there, if you're making the case that the New Testament message is a tribal one more than it's a universal one, you're going to have a hard time. No, my, my case is that it's not clearly universal. It's pretty clearly universal. And so and to I make would, a clear like this came out of Christianity claim, it's like. Man, this would be a lot stronger of a claim if it was an obvious connection here, but it's not. It's pretty obvious, especially when you put it in the context of the world at that time. This was this was like nothing anyone had ever done before to have to have a religion in that sort of a uh, of a. I, I I I'm gonna make a claim that I can't really back up with much. Just but I if you give me time to look up religions, I bet you I can find some claims of universality. Wonderful. And, I, and and frankly, that doesn't change my point. My point isn't that it came from Christianity. My point is that it's true. Well, and that because these things are true, because human beings actually have human rights, that they do. And number two, that that is what leads to great advances in civilization. And it was Christianity that was the vehicle that brought that truth to the world. Or, or, or let's say that, that spread that truth to the world 
more than any other vehicle. I would, I would be more willing to grant you, and this might be a small point, but I'd be more willing, not that I'm really going to grant it, but I'd be more willing to grant you Christians may have brought that. But whether it was because of Christianity might be harder, a harder okay. justification. Well, I think that's about as far as we're going to get in this one. It is getting really yeah. late, and yeah. uh, I think we've already gone over the time that we wanted to do. But uh, anyway, fun that's discussion, good. Forrest. Yeah, we'll keep doing it. I'm excited. <laughs> All righty. Okay, everyone. Hope you guys enjoyed this episode. Hope you all have a great night. Hey, if you enjoyed this episode and want to try to improve your engagement with those you disagree with, I want to share with you a few of the principles that Forrest and I try to abide in these conversations. First, we try to steel man each other's perspective before offering a critique. We make sure that the other person feels that we have not misrepresented their point of view. When you are not addressing the actual argument the other person is making, you just end up talking past each other. Second, we seek clarity, not consensus. We are trying to understand the nature of our disagreement and clarify the distinctions between our different points of view by comparing and contrasting the different ways we justify our position. Instead of the discussion being about winning an argument, it's about two people curiously exploring how they arrived at their different conclusions. And third, just things as simple as defining your terms can do immense good in conversation. So often people talk past each other simply because the words they are using are vague or can mean different things to different people. Much conflict comes not because of disagreement, but simply because of confused language and misunderstanding. In the end, our shared goal in these discussions is not just to engage with each other on a variety of topics, but hopefully to model how people with wildly different opinions can engage meaningfully. Do we always succeed? Of course not. But we hope that to some extent, we can be part of the solution in bridging the gaps between people of different opinions.